All the praise is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator and sustainer, the creator of all things, and the one who will cause everything to die. And the return is to him. I bear witness there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and his final prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us in Surah Al-Furqan beautiful descriptions of his servants, Ibadur Rahman. And we began last week describing and reading those uh, ayat that describe the believers who are named by Allah as his servants, the servants of the merciful. And we continue today with important attributes. He said, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout history sent a very clear message to humanity. Do not commit shirk. Do not associate other gods with me. Do not worship other gods but me. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ Every messenger, every prophet, from Adam alayhi salam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They were all ordered with the same order. There is no God but Allah, so worship him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah describes Ibad al-Rahman that they do not call on anyone but Allah. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ And he chose here the word dua that you invoke and you call on and you ask help from. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was teaching Habr al-Ummah, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma when he was a young man riding behind him he said to him, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ If you ask, ask Allah. And if you seek help, seek help from Allah. Most of our thinking goes to, I'm praying to Allah, I'm worshipping Allah, I'm not associating with Allah. But here, Allah is describing Ibad al-Rahman that they do not ask, do not invoke, do not call on or seek help from anyone but Allah. How many times we feel we are in need of help and we go and ask help from people and we say things that are inappropriate as if our risk is in their hands, as if our life depends on them. We say, doctor, please help me. Save my kid's life. How could you say that? The life of your child is not in the hand of the doctor. The life of your child is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The doctor can only administer the medical service to your child but for you to say that, it implies that you think that the doctor is the one who is saving your child's life. But it is not the doctor. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Ibrahim alayhi salam said, وَإِذَا مَرُضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ If I become sick, Allah is the one who cures me. But we say it without thinking about it. This is a form of dua or calling or asking. When we seek a job, we say to the boss, please, you know, 
there's nobody for me but you. Give me this job. No. Allah is the one who, in Allah, who are razzaq with al-quwwat al-mateen. Allah is a razzaq, not your boss, not your child, not your parent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't invoke somebody else's name or seek help from somebody else when it is all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a form of hidden shirk. You don't mean it. You are not thinking in reality. If you think about it, you know that the risk is from Allah. But it is common in our language, common in our dealings with people. We say these things to people. But that is not the attribute of Ibadur Rahman. Ibadur Rahman, when adversity happens to them, <coughs> They turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Sometimes you come and ask them, do you need help? They say, no. And you know they need help. But they don't want to ask. They, they ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see them, even with their poverty or their illness or their need, always they are humble, they are shy to ask, they don't go out and uh, sell themselves cheap, asking people and begging, but they keep it between them and Allah. They know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is going to cure them, who is going to sustain them, who is going to help them, and therefore they ask Him alone. Allah puts us in these tests, in these situations to see how we will behave, how we will act, how we sell ourselves cheap to other than him, thinking that this person, you know, can help me. When somebody help you, don't say, if it wasn't for you, I will be doomed. No. If it wasn't for Allah, you would be doomed. But him, no, you're not doomed. Say, Jazakallahu khayran. That is more than enough. May Allah reward you, okay, with good. Because only Allah can pay you back equivalent to the good that you did to me. But you cannot, you have to understand that this person is simply a vehicle that Allah used to deliver that good to you. And naturally, we would hear it. You know, as an imam, you would hear people say, you know, uh, if it wasn't for you, this would and that would happen. Say, astaghfirullah. I'm just a servant like you. I'm a human being who need help from Allah, just like you. But I happen to be in the position to deliver this help to you. But it's not me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is who is helping you. Don't, it's offensive to give credit to someone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the credit only should go to him because he is the one who actually helped you, made it possible. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ Ibadul Rahman, very careful about taking the life of a human being. Because Allah made it sacred, prohibited. It has very strict conditions when you could apply Allah's laws to take someone's life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it clear that a person cannot, or the life cannot be taken illa bi thalath. If someone killed intentionally a believer and deemed with the evidence that he has performed that, admitted to it, okay, then the punishment an nafsu bin nafs wa thayyibu zani 
the person who is married and commits zina and it's proven the person who commits a treason abandons his faith and turns against his people those strict three conditions and it's not me or you who decide such cases this is a court of law in the in a an islamic state an islamic country that has proper judicial system they have to prove these cases in order for a judgment to be issued by you know a country by a state not by individuals today we think a lot of people take matters into their own hands and say i believe so and so did this i'm going to go and kill him killing enough okay will land the person in hellfire forever let alone if in this dunya you are arrested and put in jail for life or executed but in the hereafter what you really need to worry about is that you better be mistaken and not take a life than you think you're right and you take the life of a human being and you end up forever in the hellfire but one of the signs of the end of time is the uh, increase in the number of killings rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam describing our time he said yakthurul harj the killing becomes very common we see today people getting killed for almost no reason people in this country everybody likes to buy a gun and i want to ask you when you buy a gun what do you use it for do you cook with it do you watch something on it do you read something in it it has one single use and that is to kill so you are taking a major step when you buy a gun that you are this close from killing someone it's a matter of time and how many times have you heard or read or seen on the news you know a mother killing her own child or a daughter killing her own mother or a little kid killing his sister by their parents gun so many people over 100,000 people in this country die every year from gun violence you know in the past people may have had swords or knives but it's not as fast to kill someone with a sword or a knife they have to be close enough you have to hit them in a in a specific place to really kill them instantly but with a gun it just took, takes a second you cannot undo it the person the bullet goes and the person is gone so it is very difficult especially with people who go and buy ar-15s or semi-automatic weapons and put a magazine that take 20 30 bullets and they you know kill so many people in two three seconds this is happening every day in this country people are dying on the streets of major cities and even small towns over small disputes just turn on the news open the paper uh, look online and you will see killing 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 this person killed that person it's sickening human life became so cheap you know it's it's scary that sometimes uh, you may have a very small argument with someone or you may unintentionally you know drive in front of someone and they get so angry and they pull a gun and they shoot at you I have witnessed right in front of my office 
you know, in broad daylight, in rush hour, where this person was shooting from his car on another car and shot several people in the process who have nothing to do with the guy he is chasing. So half a dozen people, their cars were shot or some of them were hurt. And then he came down and shot the person several times in broad daylight and killed him. This kind of brazen behavior became common because hardly any movie a person watches, it involves gun violence. They make it like, you know, drinking coffee. It's okay, people die. And if you don't like some, someone, you pull a gun, it's the wild, wild west, you shoot them. That's how you fix problems. So it becomes routine or acceptable in the culture. It becomes acceptable you know, among people to settle their differences with guns. Just pull a gun and shoot them. Instead of, okay, let's talk about it. Let's see what's happening. How can we resolve this small problem? But it's a staggering number of having over 100,000 people dying every year from gun violence. And among them, over 30,000 people who take their own lives commit suicide. Well, committing suicide is still killing a nafs, without a right. So on the day of judgment, the person who kills himself is going to end up in the hellfire forever. Because Allah does not give you a license to kill yourself. Allah said, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Do not kill yourselves. Allah is merciful to you. Some people just give up because they don't like life. They lost a lot of money. They, you know, were abused. Whatever the reason is. That doesn't give you a license to take on, to take your life. The life that Allah gave you is his, not yours. And if you take your own life and you say, I, I can't take it anymore, you're not solving a problem. You're creating big problem for yourself and for everybody else. You're going to go to hell. And that's why it is double danger when you allow people who have mental illness to own a gun, when you know that they have a higher you know, possibility of shooting themselves, taking their own lives. Because it's not easy for them to take their own life in other ways, like it is with a gun. There's still, there will be suicides. There will be overdoses with drugs. But the gun is just one way that is so fast and so lethal that there's no recourse. And that's why we all should be advocates for, you know, eliminating guns and for fighting against people with mental illness owning guns because often they kill themselves and kill other people in the process. If you look at most of the mass shootings that happen in this country, you find that someone with mental illness owned a gun, sometimes legally, and went on on rampage, killed everybody, and he knew he was going to be killed at the end of it. But he wanted to take as many people with him as possible. Often children, women, he doesn't care. So... It is not enough to say, I did not kill anyone, or I don't plan to kill anyone, or I'm buying this gun to protect myself and my family, okay? There are other ways to protect yourself and your family, okay? And we live in a time where there are police departments everywhere, in every country, there are police, okay? So it's not the wild, wild west where you have, everyone has to protect themselves. And how many times the police come to help someone in a domestic violence case 
and they end up shooting, you know, the person because they have a gun. So you have to be careful. And that's why we, we had the policy. We don't want people coming to the masjid with guns. Okay? No matter how, what your intention is and how well you are trained, but you're going to end up killing other Muslims, you know, because uh, even police officers in situations like this, they cannot really uh, shoot the right criminal. So often the damage is, is more with mass assemblies and schools than it is with the normal uh, situations at home. If you own a gun at home, make sure to lock it in a safe place where your children cannot have access to it. It's a tragedy for you to come and see that the gun you bought to protect your family, your kid used to kill a member of your family. So being advocates for reducing gun violence, for reducing suicide, for reducing all kinds of killing, whichever method it is, it's part of being Ibadur Rahman, Alladina la yaqturuna nafsa allati harram Allahu illa bil haq. Leave that to the courts. If somebody must be sentenced to death, that's the job of the courts not the job of the individuals, none of us. And they do not commit adultery or fornication. And zina is a general term that applies to any kind of sexual relation outside a marriage between a man and a woman, a legal marriage. So that includes child molestation, it includes, you know, if you're having a relationship with boyfriend, girlfriend, or homosexual relations, all of that is zina. And all of that is a major sin in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it categorically. There is one way for fulfilling that sexual need that Allah created in order for us to have descendants, to procreate, to have children and grandchildren is through legal marriage, through nikah shar'i, but not to be used willy-nilly for fulfilling one's pleasure and say, oh, it's no big deal. In the law of Allah, it is a major, major sin. Ibad al-Rahman, they do not get involved in such relationships. They don't get close to it. You know, do not allow yourself to be isolated with a person of the opposite gender, a person you get attracted to. Don't, you know, go to a nightclub and say, I'm just checking it out. Do not put yourself in situations that leads to zina. It is so common and so easy now in this country for people to put themselves in these situations. And they only, after they commit zina, they start questioning, should, what should I do? That in itself is a major sin that leads to other problems and other major sins. Where girls they go and commit abortion, which is another sin, where uh, abuse happens. So we have to be careful. The freedom that we enjoy in this country to do whatever we want does not give us a license to violate the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah has prohibited is for all times, all places, doesn't matter if you are near the Kaaba or you are in New York City. You have the responsibility to guard yourself. Don't, there are no excuses. And zina, as I said, is not excused. It doesn't matter. You say, well, I didn't find anyone to marry. Or 
I'm attracted to a person of the same gender. All of that is zina and it's haram and it will land the person in the hellfire for good. Not for a day or two, for good. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرُ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا The people who commit these three major sins, okay, Allah said, يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The punishment will be doubled for him on the day of judgment. وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا And he will be there in the hellfire forever. Forever. Is it worth it for an action, a choice you make that takes seconds to kill someone because of a dispute or to have a pleasure or to make you know, statements that are wrong, committing shirk, to end up in the hellfire? Allah, it's not worth it. And that's why you have to be careful in the choices you make every day. And it has become very common to hear about, like any other minority in this country, <coughs> to be influenced by the majority and to adopt many of their habits and cultural practices. There are many Muslims today who say, yeah, my son has a girlfriend or my daughter has a boyfriend. And they are like, it's normal. In this country, it's, it's acceptable. No, it's not acceptable. It wasn't acceptable in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu It's not acceptable today. It's not acceptable anytime, anywhere. So if circumstances change, those rules don't change. The words of Allah are applicable all the time, everywhere. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu he said, I asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a'zam? What's the worst or the biggest sin? He said, and tushrika billah wa huwa khalaqak. To commit shirk, to worship someone with Allah, and he is the one who created you. Wa an taqtula waladak khashyata an yat'ama ma'ak and to kill your child out of fear that he will eat with you. you know, that's what people do out of poverty, out of fear that I cannot support this child. You're not supporting them. Allah said, نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ We are the one who sustain you and them. If Allah gave you a child, this is a gift from Allah. The child will come with his risk. It's not you who is a razaq Allah is a razaq to you and to your child. وَأَن تُزَانِي حَلِيلَ تَجَارِكْ And to commit adultery with the wife of your neighbor. Because that, the proximation, there are circumstances where you may go knock on your neighbor's door to talk to them and he is not there and his beautiful wife uh, talks to you, please come in and then one thing leads to another and you just, you betrayed your neighbor in his family and destroyed your life. He said that is one of the worst type of zina. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us against this and then he recited this ayat from this ayah from surah al-furqan he said wala yad'una ma'a Allahi ilahan akhar wala yaqtuluna an-nafsa allati harrama Allah illa bil haqq wala yaznun wa man yaf'al dhalika yalqa athama yudha'af lahu al-'adhab yawm al-qiyamah wa yakhlud fihi muhana then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when this these ayat came down some of the people who have committed in their jahiliyyah and their time of ignorance 
some of these crimes, they felt we are doomed. And, you know, if somebody lost hope, they're going to go and continue doing what they were doing. So a man came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, I did all of these. Is there any hope for me? Allah revealed, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا He said, except the person who made tawbah, repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we have discussed in other khutbahs the conditions for tawbah, that you stop what you're doing, that you regret what you have done, that you ask Allah for forgiveness, and when it involves the rights of others, you restore their rights. And you have this real sincere repentance from your heart, okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows what's in the hearts, then Allah will make tawbah on you. And believed, which indicates that you, if you are already a believer, you don't engage in this and say, no problem, I'll do it and then Allah will forgive me because I'll then do tawbah after that. Don't play this game with Allah. Okay? If you already know that this is haram, okay, what guarantees for you that if you do it anyway and you challenge Allah's laws, that Allah is going to forgive you or guide you back? And this is unfortunately what so many young Muslims are doing. In Allah Ghafurun Rahim. It's okay. I'll, you know, it's okay. During young age, we all do this, and then in old age, we will do tawbah and return to Allah. And Allah will forgive everything. Don't be so sure. Don't take that risk. Allah opened this door for people who did not know. But it's not for people who know and intentionally go against what Allah has told them. Then you do not guarantee that Allah will guide your heart back to the path of Iman to seek Tawbah. You might continue, you may die on that condition. We have seen so many so-called Muslims who lived their lives in sin like this. And they died in sin while doing these things. It's very, very risky. But nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a door for tawbah for everyone. And it is a door that no one can close. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Say, O oh my servants who have wasted so much on yourselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sin. So make istighfar, come back to Allah, do tawbah, change your life before it's too late. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He knows what's in the heart. He knows your intention and why and how. And He is willing to bestow His mercy on you if you are the brother who has his adhan, close your phone, please. Please make sure when you come to the masjid to silence your phone. Because then you violate your khutbah, your jum'ah, and everybody else's. So the Prophet wasallam told this man who came and said all of this, I did all of these sins. قَالَ هَلْ آمَنْتْ قَالَ نَعَمْ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ He said, He said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفَرَ لَكَ كُلَّ ذَلِكَ وَأَبْدَلَ سَيِّئَاتِكَ حَسَنَاتِ He said, Allah has forgiven you for all of that and He has replaced your sins with good deeds. And the Rawi describes this man, he said, he was old. 
and his, you know, his skin over his eyes came down. That this man has spent a life, but that's the time when Islam reached him. That's the time when he became Muslim and he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows, you know, Allah gives him through the wahi to understand that this person is truthful. So the man left saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He was so happy. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also judged in another case where a woman came to one of the Sahaba, radhanullahi alayhim, and she said, Zanaytu thumma waladtu thumma qataltu al-mawlud. Said, I committed zina. I got pregnant, then I delivered the baby, then I killed the baby. She said, is there any forgiveness for me? Is there any hope for me? People do some very bad things in their jahiliyyah. We hear and see these things right now from people who are coming to Islam. They come with burdens. They say, in my jahiliyyah, I used to drink, I used to fornicate, I used to do this and that. Is there forgiveness for me? You know, the Sahabi said, no. How could you, you committed multiple crimes? How could you be forgiven? She was crying, she was hysteric. He went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, prayed Fajr with him, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, a woman came to me and asked me this. He said, what did you tell her? He said, I told her no. He said, how did you know? Allah forgives all sins. Tell her, yes, Allah will forgive her if she believes and, and do sincere tawbah. So he went and told her she was so happy and she committed her life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when someone, new Muslim, comes, they had so much mix-up in their past. Rasulullah said, Al-Islam yajubbu ma qabla. Islam erases the sins of what was before it. They didn't know. They don't have Islam. We are blessed to know. But so many people in this country, around the world, they're committing sins, harming themselves and others because they are ignorant of the laws of Allah. And it is important to give them the hope, return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek Allah's forgiveness, believe in Allah, Allah will forgive you. But Allah made it a condition. وَمَن تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابَ The person who makes tawbah, that tawbah has to be real, sincere, not a game. Not back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have to be sincere and you make this covenant with Allah that I promise you, O oh Allah, I will not go back. I will not kill again. I will not commit zina again. I will not, you know, commit shirk again. Don't break that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be strong. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described more qualities for Ibadul Rahman, which we will inshallah cover inshallah next week. Those qualities, each one of them is important to study and reflect in your life and see if I am doing it correctly, if I am violating it in any way. Because you want to be among Ibadul Rahman, don't you? Allah gave you the prerequisites and said, This is what you do, and then I will include you as my servant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us ibadur rahman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the sins of this world. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Alhamdulillah, hamdan kathiran kama amar. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khayr al-bashar nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. My brothers and sisters, Indeed, when we live in a society, if you live in Medina or Mecca or a, a Muslim you know, city and you have, you're surrounded by Muslims, 
it's a blessing because it protects you from a lot of sins and vice. And it is challenging when you live in an open, free society like this, where nobody is going to ask you if you were drinking or committing zina or you are doing these things. So then, then you have to guard yourself more. You have to be aware that you are at a higher risk of committing one of these major sins. And that's why it is important for us to be aware of them, keep ourselves away from the places and times where these things could happen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guard you and your children and your family. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us create a society that is based on virtue and iman.